Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Professor Julia Jaquette, if you don't know me already. And welcome to the ArtSpeak 2021-2022 lecture series presented by the Department of Fine Arts. And as you probably have experienced and know, we invite contemporary artists to talk about their work. And this afternoon, artist Yeshua Close will give a presentation on his work and background as an artist. You can see information about our previous and current speakers by just Googling ArtSpeak and FIT, and you'll come to the site. There are videotapes of many videotapes. There are videos um, of many of the previous lectures, which you can watch. And we've had um, a fantastic series of speakers over the past 10 years or so. So I highly recommend perusing that site and watching some of the previous talks. We would heartily like to thank Professor Sue Dakin for her generous support and commitment to this program in creating the Dakin Fund for the Fine Arts Department and for making these events possible. We also thank our chair, Stephanie Pierce, who is currently um, away in Boston giving a talk on her work, um, and she's sad not to be here with us today. Our speaker again this afternoon is Shua Close, who will be introduced by fine arts professor Seikong Zhao, Professor Zhao. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, it is my honor to introduce to you, is that, am I okay? I hate this. It's my honor to introduce, oh, can I? Am I? Um, to introduce the very unique artist and uh, Yushua and Clark, particularly to our students. I just uh, started uh, senior and uh, students. The first thing, the int interesting thing in is, do I gonna do, am I gonna do sculpture or painting? And uh, today I will present the artist and he really integrate 2D and 3D and combine with sculpture and pre-making. So it really crossed all different genres. So I think it's, a, it's a very interesting, very unique for our students. Um, through uh, Yushua's printmaking based collage and a sculpture, Yushua's explored the intersection of the amount of human form, nature element, and a built environment, and a social hierarchy. His practice employ a process of collage woodblock print to enlarge idea about the blackness and the maleness as identity that are both fragmented and constructed. His recent work takes on the personal histories of the race, identity, and family tie. Yu was born in 1977 in Chicago, Illinois, and currently living and works in Brooklyn, New York. He received an MFA from Northern Illinois University and DECO in 2000, and an MFA from Hunter College and City University in 2009. Both are in fine arts. He has exhibited at a student, school, a student museum in Holland, New York, and Wetherspoon Museum at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Tilton Gallery, New York, you're gonna forgive me this French, and Gallery de Pro, and in Paris in France. And his works are including in Putsuti Collection, Seattle Art Museum, and Welling Museum of Art Permanent Collection. He has been awarded residency at Bernice Center for the Contemporary Art, Brick Art, the John Mitchell Center, Scott Hegan, and the Vermont Studio Center. He is a recipient of the 2014 John Mitchell Foundation Grant and 2015 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. 
I'm pleased to introduce you to Yoshua Clark. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zell, for that introduction. Um, thank you, FIT, and specifically Julia Jaquette. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> We've been talking about doing this for a while, so I'm very excited. Um, and I used to teach and be in front of students a lot, and I haven't been in a classroom for a while, so this is great as an opportunity to, uh, to share with students. So we're at the beginning of the semester here, right? So I know everybody is kind of like, this is like clean slate. So we should have some good energy and probably some good questions um, after I deliver this information. So I'm really looking forward to that. And please ask whatever you want to ask. Um, there really are no boundaries um, around this. It could be about the work that, we're that I'm showing or uh, deeper things about uh, what happens after school or career, things like that. So um, let's go there. But I'm, I have a lot to share, so I'm going to dive into it. I'm going to start with a video, which I think uh, will kind of um, update you and where I'm at with my practice today, and then we're going to kind of go backwards um, and then see how I got there. Mother tells me a story I was too young to remember. She handed me a multiple colored crayons, and I would draw on a sheet of paper that she taped to the high chair. She says that when I got to the red crayon, that I looked at her in amazement. And she was like, yeah, that's what they do. I didn't grow up with a large family, uh, raised by my mom, south side of Chicago. Only child, raised without a father. And I think in my search for masculine identity, I turned to those natural resources around me in the environment as cues on how to posture, behave, and appear to be a man. I've stumbled forward to figure out how to keep art at the center of my life. Art has always been the thing that has kept me balanced. It's, it's almost a process of building, but I'm using paper uh, in order to describe things like brick or wood or stone. It's a, it's a process that I think in some ways is like really complex because there, there's so many stages to it, it's so layered, but at the same time it's, it's like it doesn't get a lot more basic than carving a piece of wood and inking it for its impression. About two years ago, I received a Facebook message saying, hey, we did a DNA search and we think we might be related. That Facebook message included a photo of me from when I was seven years old. It was a photo I had never seen before. I met my dad only two times in my life. First time I was seven years old, second time I was 13. And one of those times, he took me on a road trip to Michigan, where I met the side of my family. It was so long ago that the, the memory was so distant, I almost wondered if I hadn't dreamt it. I responded back, it turned into a phone call, FaceTime, and my cousin on the other end, Paige, was introducing me to her mom, my auntie, and, and this uncle, and that uncle, and it was like instantly I had realized that this was the family that I had been denied from my whole life. And I was so overwhelmed that they were reaching out to me and excited to welcome me back into the family. I was also thinking about 
My need to understand my place in this huge family. My dad was one of 15 children. To see all of those relationships, I needed to make a map. And the Diego Rivera mural provided a structure for that map. Diego Rivera made the Detroit Industry Mural in 1933. It was a commission by the Ford family in Detroit. It's a fresco that's painted directly on the wall of the Detroit Institute of Art. It's like a Sistine Chapel that's, that's like committed to American industry. At the same time, I felt left out of that mural. And by me, I also mean my family who worked at the plant and the black folks that made Detroit possible. There was no update for this mural. There was no reckoning of that history. You know, all of the labor that black folks have contributed, especially to building the Midwest. This was a history that I was interested in before meeting my family. But now that I have faces to put to the history, it just becomes that more real. I decided to remove the faceless white male workers that he depicted and put in portraits of my family. Because I figured this would be a good way for me to get to know them, to connect to them through the practice of portraiture. So I would have to spend time looking at their faces. You know, this was also about distance. This was less about objective or actual portraits of my family and it was kind of more about a portrait of the distance between us. Other works complicate the idea of portraiture a bit because while I may begin with a source reference of a family member, a photograph, I'm complicating it with these art deco patterns and with this collage of fragmenting and breaking it. Just thinking about how our identities are also constructed from the materials around us. So that becomes a part of who we are. The 2D work suggests that it's real, that it's in illusionistic space, but at the same time, we know it's flat. So there's something that kind of undermines its proposal of being real, which I was interested in that tension. A mask, to, for me, is already embedded with the tension. It resists a certain accurate depiction of reality because it's covering the face. Think about the tradition of African tribal masks, those are designed around a, a more metaphysical view of the world. The space in between physical and spiritual is abstraction. And then the history of labor, African Americans in the United States wearing this welding mask in order to protect oneself in a factory setting. The welding mask actually hides identity. The tribal mask conjures identity. Now what I'm doing is taking a torch to those masks as an act of kind of fusing them, fusing those histories together, but it's also an act of activating them. The mask is only functional once it's been danced in and used in front of people. So. My burning of the mask, my torching of it, is a way to, to dance the mask. Like a lot of artists, I make work because I'm compelled to. It's the language that I know how to speak the best. And the excitement is in getting others to speak that same language as they're reading the work, as they're looking at the work and experiencing it. 
For me, yeah, making art is almost like a portal into a language that describes things and experiences that have no other language for. Our labor is about certainly the invisible labor that black folks have contributed to building America. But more than that, our labor is about the labor that I'm doing and that my family is doing in order to connect. I'm learning from them all of the labor, all the, the, the love and the work that it takes to hold a family together. I learned from my mother actually that family is who you learn to survive for and who you learn to survive from. You know, the Our Label mural, that was an expression of my generosity to my family. As a way of saying, I know I've been gone for so long and this is what I have to contribute. This is what I do. Okay, so that uh, video was made as part of my show uh, with the Welland Museum, Our Labor, where that uh, large mural was debuted. Um, I'm going to take a step back, and now I think we all have context for this photo. So. <clears throat> um, when I first got contacted by that side of my family, I sent this photo. I'd never seen this photo before, and uh, my world started spinning, but um, obviously, while that's life-changing, a whole lot, of, whole lot of creative purpose came from that. Um, I'm going to take a step back and talk about my process. So raised on the south side of Chicago, and I taught different places. Why is that important to mention? I think these are parts of my identity that I find uh, really, really important to me and important when I start sharing my work as well. We'll get back to location in Chicago. Uh, so I'll read through some of these really quick, but I know that we don't have a ton of time and I want to give you all a chance to ask questions. Being raised by a single parent mom as an only child south side of Chicago, my work's always been about family. Aren't our ideas of identity constructed in community and built from the materials of our environments? Because I didn't have much family growing up, my friends and neighbors became my siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins. I understood family as the people who we survive with and the people we survive for. I make images of this family and their resilience. So this is me uh, as I was preparing for a show in LA at UTA Artist Space. And these works were more about um, these sort of uh, uh, com com compiled identities. So I would take images of friends, uh, sometimes family members, but at this point it was, it was mostly friends and I was sort of hybridizing identities and you'll notice that there's always this sort of plane or these uh, construction materials that, that that face, that head forms dealing with. I'm sort of like a sculptor building from the inside out. So, a lot of times when people see the work, um, maybe on a screen or uh, in print, I'm asked often, how isn't this sculpture, right? And the work is about certainly trying to kind of build that illusionistic space from very basic processes like drawing. So my process begins with drawing, here I am tracing a projection of a hand onto MDF wood where I'll then carve it. So drawing lays the foundation. I'm trying to find any possible way that I can draw using printmaking materials. Here I am carving out those drawn lines. Um, when I discovered woodblock printing, to me it seemed like the most direct uh, uh, translation of the drawn line for me. I was just, instead of adding the line, I was removing it. Woodblock printing allows me to carve into a block of wood and then print the surface that remains. So it's almost a, a recording of the kinetic gesture that I'm making with the wood. And of course, this is inking. So everything uncarved that remains on the surface of the block, 
uh, gets inked. Inking allows me to create prints of varied saturation. And I'm hand, I'm hand pressure printing, so I don't use a, a, a print or print shop that has a roller with tons of pressure behind it. Um, I'm printing these by hands, and I do that because, again, it reminds me of the sort of uh, interaction that I have while drawing. I'm allowed to create more gesture by printing by hand and, of course, control some of the density that, uh, of the print. I love using hand pressure and printing because it becomes, it becomes more democratic in that way. It's a way of removing the limitations and expectations of the process. Um, but this photo is kind of wild. I feel like it looks like I'm really a mess in that photo. Uh, that is often how my studio is. But um, I like to see all of the source material, all of the swatches, colors, and textures around me. And then I start picking those up and collaging from them. So unlike traditional collage, I'm making all my own source material. And this is me trying to figure something out. Um, that piece ended up being this. Uh, this slide is deceptive. It's pretty big. It's, I think it's 16 feet wide, 8 feet high. So let's talk about the, that grid that I, that I mentioned before that those heads were dealing with. Chicago's urban planning was designed for segregation to separate black and white. That's baked into the planning and geography of the city. When we talk about Chicago, we talk about it being on a grid, named streets intersecting numbered streets. In art history, the grid is a kind of tool for optical democracy. There's no visual hierarchy in a grid. You can enter any space at any time. I'm interested in the grid's proposal of democracy and how that's failed black folks given where I'm from and how Chicago is constructed. To some degree, I consider the grid an obstacle that has pressured black people to persist. Much of my work pays homage to survival tactics. Uh, that was certainly mentioned before. So a lot of the heads and faces look like sculptural forms. They suggest that they're built, that they're constructed out of wood, brick, rock, cinder block. These are the elements of the urban environment. These are leftover relics after a city is built. Um, there's also a lot of works that are these hand forms that are sort of juggling flowers and building materials, and the flowers are often winning. Uh, the building materials are sort of falling to the wayside. The thing about the hand in particular that I'm interested in is how do I pay tribute to the invisible labor black folks have done in building this country, and at the same time undermine expectations of the black body as a body designed for labor. So again, you'll see, if you look here, there's some bricks kind of tumbling out the way, and the hand is sort of more concerned with whatever is happening with these vining flowers. And as I started to develop this, this process, a lot of those flowers are uh, Michigan flowers, and they're native to Michigan and prairie land there. So all of that, of course, is about uh, the location of uh, my family and migration. Uh, this slide, so this is a screenshot of the initial communication uh, with my cousin. Um, I'm not going to read it, but it's, it's basically just her reaching out saying, do you know the, the Masseys and McDonald's from Detroit? And I'm mentioning to her that my dad's Leon, and she says that that's her uncle. So this is how we connected. And I like this photo as kind of an update because that initial photo that I began with was me in this backyard at seven years old, and this is us today. So again, this is the Diego Rivera mural. Um, I show this slide, I think this is valuable as I sort of like pull back the veil, especially in an academic setting, where you can see that I'm sketching through an interpretation of the initial Diego Rivera mural. So that's his mural here. Printed, and this is my initial sketch, which clearly changed a lot when you've seen images of the completed mural. The finished mural had no color, it was just uh, black ink on the canvas and muslin. And here, my initial idea, I had this like tree structure, family tree growing through it, which I think ultimately to me felt a bit too literal. 
And this is the process that I use when I'm woodblock printing. So these are eight foot by four foot pieces of MDF wood, a standard size, building size. And I carve into them, um, and I'm carving all the different parts of the mural, and then I print them and collage them from there. Uh, this is a slide of me working on the mural. That's actually uh, Paige, who is the cousin who reached out to me initially. So one thing I was thinking about with this, this piece was that I had missed so many family reunions. Uh, as you can see in that slideshow or in the video, there were all these photos of like these backyard parties, 4th of July parties, birthdays, family reunions, all these things that I felt like I had missed. And when my aunt gave me that package of photos, I felt like, wow, I would love to see everybody assembled in one location. Um, so that was also part of the mission here. Not to mention that the mural is, operates as a map for me. So having this discovery of being connected to this huge family and being raised as an only child, I didn't really understand all these familial relationships. It was mind boggling. So I, my, my grandma's here in the center and I broke it down into her three marriages. So. Uh, she had the first four McDonald's boys, that's my dad there at the end, remarried Mr. Massey, had 10 Masseys here. Th so these are all aunts and uncles, and then one last Paul Green was the baby there. So on the plant floor, this is all first cousins and some of my nephews and nieces, and then there's like a sneaky self-portrait of me in there, of course. This is a smaller work that also kind of came from that production and from the language that Diego Rivera was using in his mural with these workers that were carrying auto parts through the factory. So this one is my niece, Desiree, and it's called uh, Desiree Holding a Car Door. And you see some of this art deco design architecture sprawling through there. And of course, these uh, Michigan bluebells and wildflowers that are kind of uh, wrapping themselves around that that structure. These are two of the masks that were in the show. And this piece is called Auntie Grandma. This is kind of an homage to uh, my aunt who uh, brought her nine siblings when she was 18 years old from Memphis to Detroit uh, for her job in the auto plant. Um, so there's 15 branches. Uh, for one of each of grandma's children also. So I'm thinking about ways uh, to sort of challenge notions of this like traditional family tree structure, which to me always seemed to look like a perfect tree. It was like symmetrical and bucolic and beautiful. And this one is, this is more of a survivor tree, right? This is like a structure that's been through it, but it's still growing and sprawling. And of course, uh, charged up by the, the Ford uh, engine here. This is a welding mask and a Keith Webe tribal mask. And these are all in that body of work. So again, if you look close, you're seeing this Art Deco architecture here, which is also kind of a nod to like uh, tribal scarification. It's interesting because um, when I found this side of my family, I did a DNA test to find the African countries I was connected to. So when I tell that story to friends, they would say, oh, aren't you excited to, to get to uh, West Africa? And I would say, yes, but I'm also excited about reconnecting to uh, my family in Detroit. So um, a lot of that is sort of more homage to them. Elizabeth Catlett is uh, one of my heroes. She's, I think, one of the best artists that America has produced. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if not many people here know her name. Unfortunately, she's uh, one of the artists I think has been looked over. But Elizabeth Catlett is probably 
uh, she's one of the best woodblock printers ever. And she has a piece called Sharecropper, which is a woman wearing this um, kind of straw hat, but it's also very regal and majestic. So I found a, a photo of my cousin Tyla with the same sort of straw hat, and I wanted to uh, pay tribute to Elizabeth Catlett's work in this piece. So with a big family, you get the celebrations, but there's also funerals. Um, this, is a, this was a funeral of my cousin Tawana, and I took this photo of my other cousin Jan on the day of the funeral. She was wearing this um, R.I. Paradise uh, Tawana pin. And this brings us right up to date. So. This show, this work, I just finished it, shipped it out. This is going to uh, a gallery in Luxembourg called Zidun Basset, and the show opens September, 26th, uh, September 22nd. Again, same process. This is woodblock printing, collage together. Uh, there's some spray paint areas here. I'm trying to use spray paint sort of very delicately. I don't like it to announce itself as spray paint. It almost works more like an airbrush, sort of like a dusting. This is one of the more straightforward woodblock prints that I've done. So this is, the hand is entirely carved out of one block of wood, printed, and then I'm moving the ink around. I, I guess the technical term is hand touching. Uh, but I'm basically painting with a brush while the ink is still wet and moving it around uh, to create shadows. And the flower and text are printed separately. So this piece was exciting for me. This was kind of a breakthrough. Um, this is all spray paint here. This is like the first time I really committed to the spray paint as sort of doing something, like being a part of the imagery, not just kind of atmospherically as a way to, to sort of move color and temperature in the background. This time I used spray paint. Um, I know it, it's not a, it was a big deal for me at the time, but because um, I'm kind of, I was kind of like timid about using the spray paint, I guess. Yeah, this is all work from the same series. And of course, you're seeing that Art Deco patterning in the background here is sort of operating as a kind of like a adornment or earring. And again, you see these, uh, these Michigan wildflowers sprawling through the space, reclaiming space, that, that kind of resilience. Yeah, this one I was excited about because you have these kind of architectural notes that are really imprinting themselves on the body. So this sort of also remind me of those, that mask making that I was doing, where you can't quite separate our body from our location. Uh huh. And this is the only sculpture that's in the show. Uh, this has some charring here because I'm torching these masks. And there's also some family photos that are in here. So in some ways, it's sort of like a, a family altar for me. I think that's the last one. Yeah, that is the last slide. Thank you. How are we doing on time? It seems good. All right, great. So should we talk? Nice. This shield is weird. I feel like I'm wearing glasses with no prescription. So I will open it up to questions. 
Questions, comments, concerns? Are you just brushing your hair? Okay, yes. <laughs> Okay, you're asking, was there a point in my studio where there was a, a 2D piece that I was working on that looked like sculpture, right? Yeah, I mean, that's something I think that I would hear a lot, uh, less from people seeing the work in person and more, more as a reaction to seeing work online or in print, was that they could not understand where the, that illusionistic depth ended and real depth began. And of course, that, that's my goal with those 2D works, right, is to play with our idea of what is real, what is tangible, what's really in our space, and what it is that we're imagining, right? So I would kind of paint in shadow on top of act, areas where there was actual shadow and kind of emphasize some of that, uh, the qualities of like the 3D space. Um, so that confusion was always excited. That was part of the tension to me. Now, what I would resist, and I did this a lot as a student, other students would recommend to me, you should just make that a sculpture, right? Because they would see these 2D works that seem to be very sculptural. And I resisted that, I think because artists are hard-headed, right? And we sort of have our own idea of like our journey. Um, but also because I didn't want to remove the tension. I thought that there was something exciting happening when the viewer could assume a, that third dimension and want to believe in it, but ultimately it was not there because it was 2D. So it took me a while to figure out how to get into that third dimension, and that's where the mask came in. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, just wanted to ask, how, how did you start, uh, how do you gather your ideas and like what you want to talk about? How do you gather your ideas and just how do you, I, get, I guess, execute that in a language? Yeah. Awesome. I don't know if that's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, this is going to sound not that interesting, but I use a sketchbook, right? So I will take a lot of notes. Sometimes I just write down words, not even full sentences. Um, so I'm, I use the word as a trigger to think about a larger idea, and I will sketch. Uh, but also, each piece that I make uh, challenges me to think about what to do for the next piece. So I get ideas from making. I remember I had one professor who would assign us a project, and I would sit there and kind of like daydream about what to do, and she said, what are you doing? And I would say, I'm thinking about what to do. She would say, no, you think by doing, right? So you think by drawing, sketching, or making. And I think I, in some ways, internalized that today. My, my practice is really about gen generating ideas through production, through making things. Thank you. Yeah. Andy, with your question? Okay. Oh. I guess wherever the mic goes. Yeah, the mic. Hi. Uh, what was the process that took place to make your art your full-time job? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I taught part-time for a while, for a long time. And COVID happened. And I couldn't be in the classroom when we were doing classes through Zoom. And I didn't like that because I like to be in the room with the students. And I thought maybe this is a good time to just kind of double down on the studio practice. And that's what I did. So <clears throat> fortunately, it's been working out. But I do miss, I, I do miss the classroom. I, I miss teaching, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I felt like it was the right timing for me. It was just the sort of 
perfect timing because of COVID. And I was also just at the point where I was like, let me see what'll happen if I just commit 100% to the studio. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks for the lecture, it's such beautiful work. Thank I'd you. like to know how you use the multiple in your work. I assume that you're not additioning the, the, when you make a carving, but can you talk about like how you use the, the ability to make a multiple and, um, and what that means in your work? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a lot of my process is kind of antithetical to printmaking as we understand it. So I do not use multiple prints usually in the same work. I may even carve a block, print it five times, choose one of those to use and not use the other four. So there's, it, doesn't make, it doesn't necessarily benefit me in terms of multiples, but it gives me multiple choice for that one that I need, if that makes sense. Now there are pieces where, for example, the mural, the mural, I broke down Diego's main compositional structures into wheels, pipes, and like track, like track system. And I, I discovered which parts could be reproduced. So if there were three wheels in his piece, maybe I could carve one wheel and then print it three times and alter it each time. So in that way, you know, multiples definitely helps. But um, rarely will I do an addition. That one piece where I talked about the hand being mostly carved from one block, that I will do uh, small multiple additions because I'm hand printing, right? And I'm doing that by myself. So I think that's an addition of five pieces. And it, even, even with that, there's still some collaging. So n the multiples are never identical, right? Most printmakers want, they want to eliminate the, uh, the guesswork and the randomness through the prints by creating the matrix first and then every print after that remains the same. I'm kind of doing it the other way where I'm like, I don't even, when I carve a block, I'm not even sure what I'm gonna do with it, but I wanna create as many variations and then choose. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, we got really print nerdy right there. We're, we're about to get a little bit more print nerdy. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so, um. I'm very interested in printmaking myself. And when I'm thinking about printmaking, I'm also thinking about um, the materiality of the ink. And your materiality of your ink is very um, sophisticated. So can you talk about, um, can you talk about um, when you're mixing your ink and the difference between stiff ink and loose ink and how you're using them to depict uh, space and also how you're using them to depict line. Um, I think that that's pretty, that's, that's pretty good, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, you, just, you just took me to the limit of my print nerdiness with that uh, because I've been in print shops and I've worked with printmakers who are very specific about paper they use print uh, the inks they use, right, the brands and all that. Um, I have boiled down some core needs for me. The papers that I use, I want them to be archival, right? So I don't really care where they're from. Um, obviously, every paper has its own GSM or weight to it, uh, so some of that matters. But because I'm printing by hand and I'm looking for variation, I'm looking to make mistakes, I'm looking to find things. I can print on any kind of paper and with any kind of ink that holds up. Okay, so etching ink is gonna be stiffer than relief block ink. I will still use etching ink if it's a good color that I want and then I'll add transparency to it to kind of thin it out so that I can really move it around, right? So again, as long as it's oil-based, I only use oil-based inks because I like the luster. Um, I also like that they stay wet in case I want to move them around later with a brush. Um, yeah, and the drying time is a lot slower, right, on the block and all that stuff. So does that, I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, it, it definitely does answer my question. Um, because here uh, we learn with, we learn with, uh, with water-based uh, inks, so they're easy to clean up in the studio. But um, when we were learning how to do monotypes and stuff like that, I did learn how to use uh, oil, oil paint to, mm -hmm. to do a monotype. Mm -hmm. So, so um, just before I hand it off to, to Ruki, I just wanted to ask in addition. So uh, do you ever use like oil paint on, on the wood block and then print the impressions of oil paint instead of ink or always ink? I don't do that. Um, I just use the oil-based inks. I could, you could probably do it, and it could be fine. It just has a whole different viscosity. It has a different thickness, um, and then the drying time is, is different, and I would just rather not deal with uh, another variable like that. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I really appreciated your presentation because it's printmaking and painting that made me realize that it's fine arts that I want to do and pursue a career in. Um, as a black artist, I, uh, learning in school right now, I found it a little difficult coming across like other black artists in our curriculum. Uh, it's a lot of the time my own personal research that's brought me across to artists such as Amy Sherrill, then Jacob Lawrence, and Philomona Williamson. Uh, I was wondering if you also found it difficult to find black artists to get inspired by, and I also want to know who are your favorite artists of color. Yeah, so um, growing up on the south side of Chicago, we had these like local heroes in the arts. And so I knew the names of artists that I was surprised when I went to school that my professor didn't know the names of some of these heroes like Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White. And to some, some degree, I felt like I was educating them to educate me. And that was a little bit frustrating. Um, thankfully, I think we're at a point where artists like Elizabeth Catlin and Charles White, they, there's a little more recognition of them. Charles White just had some uh, huge museum shows. Um, but yeah, I think you got to continue to do your own research, obviously. Um, because it's, it's a lot of us out there, and it's, it's more coming. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Also, one of them is here, uh, <laughs> Lakiwa Brown. I'm going to blow her up. This is, this is my friend. She's an amazing artist. Please look up her work. Can, is there a, is it, what's the best way to do that? Uh, Website? Uh, I'm sorry to do that to you. I'm just so excited that she's here. I'm sorry, y'all. What's, what's your Instagram? Uh, Lakeela Brown. Lakeela Brown. Lakeela Brown. Check it out. Thank you. I Great just work. want to say, uh, I just want to say, if somebody raised hand before he finished, so I can pass the things faster, okay? Okay, she's gonna, yeah, raise your hand after. Um, so what went into what made you determine the colors that you use for your portraits? Because I noticed that, like, it was a lot of browns and blues, but also, like, a lot of white, like, your mm -hmm. line work was, like, just white and I was like okay that's cool and I was like what made it almost muted but still colorful as well yeah you got it um muted I think I had been intimidated by color for a while because co color is really powerful right and I didn't want 
I didn't want uh, this kind of formal quality of color sometimes to like over be overbearing um, as I was thinking about things that I think were more important to me, right, in the portrait. Um, but I was also thinking about earlier works were about statues and monuments, right? So even in those head forms that you saw, those look like they're kind of made out of pieces of wood or concrete or bricks. So I'm thinking about natural materials in the environment, how they weather over time, right? How at one point, they may have been very brilliant in their color, but then they do get muted just through the wear and tear of life, just through being outside. So that's why there's a lot of that, that mutinous. Now, there's a blue that I really started to get obsessed with, and that came about through uh, my discovery of this like ultramarine blue. It's a lapis, goes back to lapis lazuli, ancient Egypt. So it was the first royal blue, right? Um, so I was always excited about the kind of African origins of royal blue. And then I thought about blue as a color with so much social value to it, right? There are all these associations we make, blue blood, blue collar work, the blues. There's all these sort of varied uh, societal uh, expectations on a color blue. So that got me excited about blue, beyond the fact that it was just beautiful and I saw, saw that specific blue kind of like vibrating, right? So viscerally, it did something to me. And then usually, if something does that, uh, where I just feel like I'm attracted to something, then I do the intellectual research and start figuring out its history, what, what am I responding to that I may not be aware of, and so on. So that's kind of where I'm at with, with color right now. The mural didn't need any colors, black and white, because uh, as I mentioned, it's a family diagram for me. So I didn't feel the need to, uh, to colorize it. Um, what's a piece of advice you would give your younger artist self? How young? Your age? How old are you? I'm 21. Okay. So maybe like when you're like 18 to 21. Yeah. Mm. I'm old now. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> for, for younger artists, I think it's like, and when I, when I was younger, I noticed this from my peers, that a lot of my peers, I felt, had a vision of being an artist that was really romantic. Like, they thought, if I just do this one show, or if I just get this gallery, or if I just just a certain thing, they felt like they would have it made. And what I'm here to tell you is that it's never ending. The, the work is never ending. There's no shortcutting the work part. So success leads to more, more work. And that, you know, hopefully leads to more success. But there is no way to kind of like hit it, hit it big at a young age, be a star and then be absolved from the work you have to do. You can be a star, but it will put you in a different predicament where then you have different pressures and different types of, of work to figure out. Um, so I would say be prepared for, the, for, a longer, for a long road, a long journey. That's fine. Long, long, the long road, the long journey is good. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that when you have ideas, you write them down, but they, do you feel ever like that you're running out of ideas, like that you're not motivated? Yeah, I, I, I don't, um, and I, you know, writer's block or creative block is a real thing. Um, fortunately, I'm obsessed with so many things, and I'm also curious about things, right? So I kind of just put my, if I start to feel like, the well is kind of dried up, it's like I'm not excited, I will put myself in new situations to learn new things. Um, and I've recently felt that, actually. I, recently, I felt like for, for the first time I can remember, it's been hard to go to the studio. And I thought to myself, why is that? Well, I just finished the show. I might be drained. 
So now what I'm planning on doing is traveling, seeing some things that I've never seen before, getting out of the country, and just absorbing new information, right? Because I think our ideas come from uh, you know, new, new, new information, things that will trigger things inside of you. So it's good to step outside of your typical um, routines. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about this show that you've got coming up in, in Brussels, like how you got in touch with this gallery, what that process has been like, um, what you're hoping to get out of it, and maybe even a little about your relationship to the European art market? Okay, that's a lot. Um, let, me, let, me start with the, let me start with the show. So, uh, ah, how about this? So, how did I meet them? I met them through Instagram. And I did that, I think, because during the pandemic, um, I was posting a whole lot more. I decided that I was going to post a lot, make a lot more work. Even I posted old work. I would post two times a day sometimes, three times a day. Um, and I knew that everybody was on their phones a lot more during the pandemic because we couldn't go anywhere. So uh, I kind of used that as an opportunity to just um, you know, create more of a presence. They must have taken note of that. I was also doing that show at UTA in LA. Um, and maybe word got around about that. But uh, they reached out to me. We did. I sent them two pieces for a group show. Uh, the group show went well. They liked the work in person. And uh, they wanted to discuss doing a solo show uh, soon after. So um, it was weird because I'm like, what is Luxembourg? I've, I don't know this place, you know. And I really wanted to meet them. So I went to Luxembourg to meet them. And I wanted to make sure the gallery was real. You know, I, wanted to, I really wanted to feel everything out and see it in person. Because um, I don't like the idea of sending work somewhere that I haven't been and don't know the people. So I went to go meet them, and they were, they were great. They were cool, very professional. Um, and the relationship just kind of developed from there. Yeah. So I just finished the show and sent it out, and uh, hopefully it goes well. It's me again. Hello. Hey. Hi. So uh, my, I have another question, and that question is, when you when you finished your bachelor's degree, uh, I guess what was what, what were your thoughts about pursuing further education? Yeah. Like, gotcha. basically, as as summarized as you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I after I did my BFA, I was definitely done with education for a while. So I thought, and um, you know, I think I. I I thought really, I thought probably pretty, I thought more of myself than I should have at that time. I thought that I was like secretly a genius, you know, and I was like, they're going to discover me right away, you know, and it didn't work out like that. I was sleeping on my mom's couch for a few years, and I had some friends who were going to, who had planned a road trip to uh, the East Coast here um, to look at grad schools. And I considered these friends smarter than me, so I decided to tag along. We all made portfolios. Back then, you had to make physical portfolios and slides. So we did that, and we hit the road. And I fell in love with um, New York. And I applied to Hunter, didn't get in. I got into Pratt, so I went to Pratt for a year and then reapplied to Hunter. But my goal was to be in New York around people who were ambitious and who really wanted to make art as a living. That to me was the most important thing. It was more important than the actual institution that I was signing up for to do my MFA, which is why I went to a school that I was unhappy with at, at first. And by the way, Pratt has a brilliant MFA program now, but when I was there, it wasn't working for me. Okay, so I reapplied and went to Hunter, and that was amazing. Um, so I wanted to be, my education, for me, the best part of it was to be around other students who were just dead serious about making the best art they could make. 
and I didn't think I wanted an MFA, uh, but what I wanted was to be around that energy. The, the, just the energy of like curiosity and all the education, all that that came with it was, was the most important thing. So that's when I, that's when I stumbled, in, uh, for, stumbled forward and decided to get the MFA. Does that make sense? Makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Also I should say that when I was looking at MFAs, one thing I did hear constantly was that they liked students to be out of school for a few years before applying. Because they want to know what you're making on your own time without class assignments and deadlines and who you are. How committed are you once no one's looking and you have to produce on your own? That was something that was beneficial to applicants um, when they started to apply to MFAs. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um could you tell us a little bit about the logistics of sending your work around, um, especially abroad? Uh, does the gallery organize it for you, or do you have to go after it? Is there insurance? Uh, or okay. Um, yeah, so usually the, yeah, the gallery handles that, okay? So they will provide insurance. They set up art handlers and art shippers who will come to your studio package up the work amazingly. They treat your work better than you treat it, right? So they're in there with, the, you know, with gloves on and everything is very, so it's beautiful and um, they're the ones who handle that. Um, as an artist, if you're working with a gallery, that's one thing you should expect from the gallery is that they're gonna handle those things. So that's what happens. Um, hi, I want to ask, like, because you say you are now, like, uh, fully in studio right now. Uh, how, long, how long do you work each day? And, like, do you, do you tell yourself that, like, do you strict yourself with, like, how many hours you need to work every day? And are you able to follow that? Or mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I don't usually... I don't usually have a set time of how many hours that I want to be in a studio. What I have set on my schedule is deadlines for works that have to be made. So that keeps me on pace. Because if I'm doing a show and I know I have to make 15 works for the show, uh, and I have a certain amount of months to make the show, then I know how many works I should be making every week. Does that make sense? Right, so having said that, there's times in a studio where I might spend uh, 12 hours, I might spend uh, 16 hours in the studio. Yeah, and then I'm at a position now where the show is out the door and I just do six hours, five or six hours and I'm good because I'm over the hump of production. Does that make sense? Hello again. Hey, a uh, lot of you, repeat customers. It's good. <laughs> you mentioned uh, during your search of your masculine identity in the video that you use cues around you to gather how to act and behave as a man. Um, did you ever have to do that with your identity as a black person? Um, I think that it took me into my early 20s to figure that out about myself and even reflecting back in my experiences at FIT, I would say that it's wild to me that I'm just now having my first black professor this in my third year here, let alone in the FIT curriculum. So I want to know what it was like for you to come to terms or understand yourself as a black man. Wow. <laughs> How much time we got? <laughs> There's plenty of time. No, um, I would say, you know, the thing about identity is that, uh, yes, we are uh, partly the DNA genetic structure that, we, that has been, we've inherited, right? It's been passed down to us. We are also in part um, hopes, dreams, fantasies, ambitions, um, pressures around us that we absorb. And that is part of like, I mean, that's sort of what my work is all about, right? It's like how identity is on the one hand, um, a given, and then on, on the other hand, is built. And, we, and we're sort of involved with constructing that. Um, often, we are not uh, 
conscious about the way that we're constructing our own uh, identity and ideas of self. Um, that goes with gender, uh, race, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it's just a constant journey. I mean, you know, we're always learning about ourselves and responding to uh, what we're noticing as pressures that may be um, unjust or undue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of like, in general, the, the way that I look at it, my work is really also um, cathartic for me in that way, because I'm using my work as a way to get to know myself, right? Yeah. Um, Anyone else? Oh, Julia Jaquette has a question. Thank you for dashing down. Um, so, Shu, on your mural, you worked with students at Hamilton, is that right? In your Welland show? Yeah, I worked with 15 Hamilton students, not on the mural that, that we saw here. There was oh, another okay. piece that is also large. It was uh, 26 feet long, 10 feet high, or something like that. And 15 students worked with me on that. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about how, what the process was when you were working, um, when you basically, you had these young artists as mm -hmm. your assistants and uh, collaborators. Yeah, it was, um, it was strange for me because I realized at some point that the more I was physically touching the art and making it, I was actually making the process less efficient. So I, I realized I was more valuable working as like a project manager. So 15 students helped me. I think we separated into different teams and different parts of the process. Some would be carving a block, some would be inking and printing, some would be cutting out those prints and mounting them on a canvas. Um, so there was sort of, a, in some ways, like an assembly line um, process. But I became sort of more of an eye on the operation and guiding them to try things rather than, um, you know, the kind of like hands-on artist that I'm used to being in my studio. Yeah. How'd you feel about that experience? It, it, was, it was great because I actually really love working with uh, assistants. Um, I have one assistant now, like one and a half, there's another that comes, but the thing I love about it is that they will translate a direction that I give them differently than I would, and then it gives me something new to respond to that I wouldn't have predicted on my own, right? Because on our own, we all have our own aesthetic, we have, we have our own way of problem solving and doing something, but when you introduce somebody else into that, they might try something that I wouldn't try. And then I go, oh, yeah, that's, maybe that will work. So, yeah, it can, it can work. It can work out. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, there's one up in the middle. Uh, so this is kind of like going back to the same question. Does it ever feel a little bit less personal because there's someone else in putting their idea into your work or does it not really matter? Someone else meaning an assistant? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't for me um, because I'm still invested in the parts of the work that do feel very personal. So um, I look at it like an underpainting, right? My, my assistant might paint the background or do the, do the first layer of underpainting, but I know that the part from, that I need is in that the layers on top of that, right? So I still feel like the work is still mine, it's still very personal. I make sure that it's, 
it still, uh, still has everything that I need to get from it, from the work. And if it doesn't have what I need to get from it, then we have to keep working, you know, because that's how I know a piece is finished, is when I've learned something from the piece and when I feel like it's, it's taught me something. Yeah. Adjacent question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's time, is there times where um, you feel like maybe your life gets in the way of your art making or have you built your life in a way that art making takes like first priority and that nothing else gets in the yeah, way? Yeah, it does. This is, where <laughs> this is where I get to sound boring, okay? So yeah, I think, <laughs> look, look, it's like, yeah. Um, I think it's so hard to be an artist that you really end up doing it a lot and um, probably um, yes, I would say I, I compromise a lot of like playtime for work a lot, but I get so much out of my work, right? So that's the, that's the thing is that um, I, the the work feeds my soul, so I, I feel so uh, comfortable and happy in that in that place, even when it's challenging. Um, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, this is kind of a boring question, but how did you Please. build your um, art career to be able to like fund you financially? Like, how were you able to support yourself and kind of build your business model? I guess. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing that I found was connecting with other artists who I saw as successful in whatever way. So I have friends who make amazing work. I want to hang around them. I have friends who are uh, finding a way to sell the work. I hang around them. They're not always the same people, right? Um, but for me, it was role modeling because I didn't have a lot of role models for like, how do I become a professional artist? There's no handbook. Um, and a lot of what I got in school was about growing my creative process, not about my professional process. So um, that is, I think role modeling is key, being around other artists. You can ask them all kinds of questions about you know, what they're selling a work for, uh, how is it like working with this specific gallery, um, you know, how are you doing taxes around this. You know, there's all those things that um, you, I think you really have to have those kind of conversations with, uh, with other artists for. Uh, but your question was about me. Like, when, when did I feel like I could support myself? Is that? Yeah, I guess. Like, yeah. how was the transition from, like, I don't know, getting out of college, making, yeah, like having yeah. to like, work like a normal job to make ends meet and then trying to really have yeah. your job be the work? Yeah, I mean, so I talked about how I taught um, part-time for a long time so I would I did that in order to feel stable um, and try to save money which is really hard to do in New York almost impossible for me so when I started to figure out how to sell work it just made sense uh, to spend more time making work when I was realizing that selling work was working um, so that, that was how I made the decision. It was just pretty evident at a certain point that I needed to spend more time in the studio than doing other things that weren't, that weren't funding me. Yeah. Last time. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a plan B or was art, you knew that art was going to be what you died doing? Yeah, I, I, I tried everything, but I always knew I was an artist. I didn't know how to be a professional artist but I knew I couldn't stop making art, so I was going to have to figure it out. That's just how it was for me. Um, teaching seemed like my plan B. My mom is a public school teacher. Um, I love teaching. I, I had been teaching uh, even during undergrad, like doing work with nonprofits and community centers and things like that. So I loved it. Um, 
so yeah, that was my plan B. But I always knew I was going to make art, mm -hmm. and I had to find a way to, to, to keep it at the center of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And, yep. Yeah. Um, what is the album that you listen to most when you create? Um, so I'm weird because I won't listen to a whole album. I'll find one song that I can zone out on and I put that on repeat sometimes. So I also love lyrics, but I love them too much. So when I'm in the studio, I don't want to hear lyrics sometimes. So if I can find some instrumental, um, or something, it's a song that, that the lyrics are light. Like right now, I've been obsessed with that Lauryn Hill song that's on the uh, Queen and Slim soundtrack, Guard, Guarding the Gates or whatever. Yeah, I, got, I listened to that for 72 hours and made great work. So that's how, I, that's how I kind of function. There's times where if I'm working on a piece and I have it figured out, I'm over the hump and, I, and it's kind of just about finishing it, then I can play whatever. Sometimes that could be even be a podcast um, or something like that. Yeah, so I'll do that often. I'll, I'll break it up, play podcasts. But I've learned to become sensitive about which times in the creative process I'm at because I can't like play dance music at the beginning. It's not going to work. I'm being there having fun and the work doesn't, it's a, it's a different thing. Um, are you interested in like generating or seeking out another major breakthrough like the one where you found that side of your family or are you like comfortable where you are and just like slowly evolving now? Um, I'm always interested in breakthrough. Um, there, I don't, I can't anticipate anything like the kind of breakthrough that I've had in finding my family, that's, you know, that's like life changing. But that continues to be breakthroughs. Like the more time I spend with them continues to be uh, generous. So um, there's that. But I think as artists, we're always kind of like searching and looking for things that, that feed that curiosity, for sure. So I'm always, I'm always interested in that. Julie, how about that time? Anybody want to ask do one the last more? question? One last one. Anybody want to? Make it good. No? OK. Is that it? OK. Thank you. I want to commend you guys for being so curious and asking so many great questions. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.